and no dinnertime television weatherman to alarm or reassure us. If a hurricane formed, we got our information about its position from the skirts of the storm, from ships who were trying their best to avoid it. We thus knew more about where an approaching storm wasn't than where it was. to about 30 miles per hour and then turn northeast out to sea. What was unusual about the 1938 storm was the speed it gained. This storm was rolling now at nearly 60 miles an hour and it had turned north. It was racing straight for New England. What were the people who lived and worked along the northeast coast doing to prepare? virtually nothing. In New England, tropical storms were rarer than palm trees, and the last really powerful hurricane to have struck the area hit more than a hundred years before. That was the Great Gale of 1815. There was nobody alive who remembered it. Even if there had been accurate warnings of the storm's approach, it would have been a rare man then who would have heard or believed them. In those days, they never used to listen to weather reports. In fact, I don't ever remember my father listening to a weather report. They'd look at the sky in the evening before and, and uh, tap the barometer in the morning and see what the sunset looked like and take it from there. Nowadays, if they don't get a weather report, why everyone screams that the, the weather bureau isn't on the ball or the Coast Guard isn't on the ball. And I think if they warned the people of a hurricane at that time, uh, they would have just considered it another line storm and let it go with that take it as it comes when you get to We weren't used to keeping our radios on. We weren't looking for anything like that. And uh, they said there was warnings, but evidently uh, they weren't uh, anything that any of us would be hearing. As I say, uh, we naturally either have television and radio going on all the time, mostly now. 
But uh, in those days, you just tuned it in at night with the news or something. So I'm not certain they had a radio. I don't think they even had a radio. At 8.30 on the morning of September 21st, the Hurricane Center was officially reported somewhere east of Cape Hatteras. At noontime, east of Virginia. High tides and gale winds were expected in Connecticut late that evening. In fact, the storm was hundreds of miles further north and roaring like a fast car toward the coast. Here was the danger. On this satellite photograph, you can see that Narragansett Bay is the first significant indentation in the Atlantic coastline north of Philadelphia. And it was here that the terrible right shoulder of the hurricane would strike the long arms of the bay holding and squeezing the awful storm surge even higher. Most vulnerable of all were those delicate white lines, the barrier beaches of southern Rhode Island and Massachusetts, crowded with hundreds of summer homes and cottages. Late in the morning, the air was still clear. Some fishing boats had put out. At midday, picnics took place as scheduled. Some of those who went swimming, however, noticed something. The water was surprisingly warm. In the early afternoon, there was a faint yellowish tinge to the sky, and the wind began to pick up. Now, in the harbors and bays of New England, small trees began to shake, and boats at anchor began to toss uneasily. At two o'clock, anyone who happened to listen to a radio would have been told that the tropical storm was somewhere at sea off New Jersey. But by then it was too late. The great hurricane had already struck land. Wind and rain lashed the Jersey coast and New York City flooding the streets and rupturing steam pipes. Hundreds of miles north in Winchester, Massachusetts, the winds whipped the usually calm water of a reservoir into a chop and dashed waves up the embankments. At first, the rising wind and waves were a curiosity, and many people left safety to drive to the shore to watch what they thought would be an exciting surf. Some never returned. High tide was expected in the late afternoon and that Wednesday was close to the autumnal equinox, the day that sun and moon combined to create the highest tides of the year. Riding in on top of the bellying swell of this double tide was the great storm surge of the hurricane. When it should have been low water, the ocean was already at high tide level, the water rising almost visibly, minute by minute. Small boats pounded ashore or broke their moorings and went scudding inland over submerged lawns and fields. At Weekapog and at Point Judith, two towns on Rhode Island's southern coast, Ella Ruick and Jack Westcott were trying to keep the driving water out of beachfront homes. Well, I heard a crash upstairs, so I went up to investigate and I found out that one of the large windows had been blown in. In, uh, one of the bedrooms, and uh, I tried to fix it, you know, get something to hold up against it, but the wind would blow everything down, so I just had to give up, and I went downstairs, and by that time, the water was uh, on the floor of the dining room, and I thought it was leaking through the windows, and uh, I wasn't, uh, I looked out of the window down there, and I see what seemed to be large black birds flying through, flying through the air and uh, it turned out to be the roof shingles coming off. And uh, then as I uh, was waiting there, I heard a knock at the back door. I uh, went to the door and tried to open it, but there was so much suction in the house 
that it wouldn't, uh, it was almost impossible to open it. And uh, so I didn't know until later that uh, police were going from house to house to notify people to get out. We came home from the school around 3.30 that day and went in the house. My father was home. He said, said there's quite a storm. He went fishing that morning. In fact, the whole fleet did. They didn't have any bad weather report. They didn't get many weather reports in those days anyway. And uh, went in the living room. The water's pouring through all the south windows. So we went to the kitchen, got some pans, put down under the windows to catch the water, keep the floor from getting wet. And we still soon found out we couldn't keep up with the water. So we rolled the rug back. Father went to the front door and opened the door. And he said, my God, the breakers are on the porch. We better get out of here. And so I grabbed my raincoat and uh, my handbag, and I got out of there. And the, as I say, the wind was blowing so hard that I uh, practically had to almost walk on in all fours. So I bent way over. I, evident, if I hadn't, I would have been blown into the pond. I couldn't walk upright. And later, Mrs. Buffum told Mrs. Taylor that I, uh, she saw this, but she thought it was a huge dog, and she paid no more attention to it. The sea pounded at bulkheads and breakwaters. Twenty miles inland, people could taste salt in the driving rain, and many along this coast began to realize that this was no simple nor'easter. Then the screw tightened. The wind literally screamed as its speed rose 60, 80, 120 miles an hour on the south coast. In the Blue Hills Observatory outside Boston, the instruments blew apart but recorded the speed of the gust that destroyed them, 186 miles an hour. The ocean poured over the beaches and opened breachways across the sand, isolating many cottages and homes. People realized that their lives were in danger and that it was too late now to escape. They moved from room to room, floor to floor in their houses as the walls broke around them. All they could do was to hang on. I went upstairs and I, my first memory upstairs was seeing Daddy, and I can't remember who it was, trying to hold up the um, front door where the water was just cascading against it. It was just being pushed flat on top of it. And I remember those waves breaking there. Uh, prior to that, I understand that the windows had been going and, and uh, the water was at that level. Then we went up to the second floor, where uh, we gathered in a, a room that was situated at the back of the house, which is my father's. I do remember a side view looking out this way, which is where the house where the nesters live, right next to us. It was a very dirty uh, shingled house. And I remember very distinctly seeing the cook who had always made me do very often outside on the porch, and she got hysterical, and I do remember a wave coming and she jumped. She jumped into that wave, and her life was lost. I also remember standing at that window and seeing that house go, seeing the wave break over the house and the whole house go. No one could stand in the wind, scuttling on all fours or lying flat on the ground. Those who looked out seaward saw a terrifying sight. The storm surge had arrived. A huge pulse in the height of the ocean, it was topped with real breaking waves, 10, 15, and 20 feet high. The wind had sliced off the crests of the waves and they became black rollers, running on a sea that was itself 10 feet higher than it had been for 120 years. The surge and the huge breakers washed over the coast with frightening swiftness. Buildings came apart like flimsy cardboard boxes, and the water rushing inland was a soup of timbers, spars, bits of wall, mattresses, rooftops, sheds, and thousands of playing cards. When we reached the third floor, basically the um, house began to wash away under us. In fact, it was. It went out from under us, and there we were on the third floor with a little bit of the roof which eventually 
went off on it, broke off and went off on itself. There was a pipe that was coming up. I don't know why it was there. I think to hold the roof. My father uh, hooked his leg around that pipe and held on. Everybody held on to each other. I, being the littlest, was next to my father and under his coat. And I can remember very vividly the count of one, two, three, duck, and a wave would break over us. One, two, three, duck, and a wave would break over us. It seemed to me that it went on forever, but I guess it really didn't. Um, we floated across. Well, but my parents didn't know where we were going. They really thought we were headed for Block Island. And I can remember the excitement when they spotted Denison's Rock, which is a buoy right out here. At that time, I didn't know what it meant. Now I know that it meant that we were in the bay and we were headed for shore. We weren't being pushed out into the ocean. Further up the bay, compressed by the narrowing shoreline, the waves were less powerful, but the water was rising even higher. Boat houses and yacht clubs shuddered, collapsed or lifted free and sank. At the head of the bay in Providence, the water ran an incredible 13 feet above normal high tide. It rose over the banks of the river and rushed into the downtown area as office workers watched from second story windows in disbelief. Sidewalks, then cars, then trolleys disappeared under the waves, their roofs like a series of lily pads in a pond. Above the wind, the jangling and blaring of burglar alarms and car horns as they shorted out. Roof shingles and shards of glass whipped by like shrapnel. Inland rivers and streams already filled from three days of rain during the week crested and overflowed. Connecticut became a cluster of islands as men with sandbags worked feverishly into the night to protect what they could. In Tiverton and Newport, Rhode Island, in Westport, Fairhaven, New Bedford, and Woods Hole, Massachusetts, heaving seas, brutal winds, and water that kept rising. Ella Ruick had crawled from her cottage and had taken shelter with some workmen in the Weekapog Inn, a huge rambling building about 30 feet from the ocean. The room that I was in uh, was in the back of the inn. You couldn't see the ocean from it. Not the, uh, you weren't facing the ocean. I could see uh, where along towards Chronic and Chalk, but before that, I had gone down uh, to one of the front windows, and I saw this huge wave come bashing against the inn, and I thought, well, that's just too much to watch, and decided to go up in the other little room and stay there. Mr. Wheeler came in, and the uh, floor was buckling under me. Uh, the uh, floor kept going up and down, up and down. And uh, he asked me if that was really so, or was he the only one feeling it? Because he, I mean, he may have thought that he was a little bit seasick or something. And I said, Mr. Wheeler, that is really happening. I said, that uh, it, the, the floor is really buckling under me. But still, I felt calm about it because I thought, well, if it does nothing but that, it, it isn't too bad. Ellery Thompson made his way from Mystic to Stonington, Connecticut, to try to save his fishing boat. Well, I was home, uh, you know, around noontime on the 21st, and my car was broke down over in Delagrange Garage in Stonington, so 
I told my mother, I said, I'm going to take the bus to, to Stoyden. And uh, I was lucky to get, ever get to Stoyden because the storm kept increasing. On the way over, I could see the Mystic River where the, the, the shoreline followed the coast then. And I never saw such sa savage white caps. I said, I never seen them as uh, bad as that. And there was a pregnant woman on the bus. And luckily, she got off at Stoyden because I was being to think by God what I knew about uh, <laughs> and I didn't know much, but she got off and we continued on. I was the only passenger, and the bus just made Stoyden when it all hemmed in. I got off, and I figured I had to crawl down from the green into the coffee pot restaurant. Uh, and the hurricane hadn't struck then. It, uh, roofs was going off, automobiles were tipping over. It must have been going about 80 miles an hour. So we got in there, and a liquor store had broken open there. And the whiskey bottle was rolling down the street. So someone dotted out and got a hold of a couple, brought it in. So we started drinking coffee royal, take the pain away. And then at 3 o'clock, I heard this on a godly screech. That was a hurricane. 170 miles an hour, you know, right from 80 to 90. So I got to peek out. So the landlord let me go through his building so I could peek out the front windows. Couldn't see anything. So he had a door there. I could pretty have lost my arm. I opened the door and stepped out into a regular sheltered V. But when I did, the door slammed behind me, and if it ever took my arm off. And so I, down the dock, I saw the boats going one by one. My boat, the yellow, held it on the very last. Finally, she lay way out there, and just one stern line. Finally, that snapped. The building was gone. Everything was gone, all but the yellow. She darted across the slip. She struck the other side, rolled over on a beam end. And then everything all shut out, a mass of salt, and you know. So when it lifted up, I could see she was gone. I thought she was sunk, but she wasn't. Then came the fires, one in Peterborough, New Hampshire, and another in New London, Connecticut, where fallen wires sparked flames which burnt the heart out of the business district by morning. Night fell, and the sky began to clear. Without power or telephones, the communities along the coast were isolated and surrounded by confusion and rumor. Whole towns had been washed away. Galilee was gone. Weekapog was gone. Watch Hill was gone. In many cases, the rumors were true. For some of those who had survived along the coast, it was worse. Bruised and wounded, huddled in barns and ditches, they could look south and see the flames from New London against the night sky. It seemed like the end of the world. The headlines the next morning told only part of the story. The reality was much worse than anyone could yet imagine. Along the south shore of Long Island, great waves had scoured the beaches at the Hamptons and Amagansett. Transmission towers were down. Giant trees had fallen. Across the bay in Connecticut, the rest of the world discovered the wreck of the Bostonian out of New York. It had been missing since the day before. At the height of the storm, with the tracks awash and beginning to buckle under the train, the crew had uncoupled the last cars minutes before they slid into the bay. The engineer inched the train forward toward dry ground, dragging power lines and poles with it as it went. One last obstacle, the house lying across the tracks, was nudged aside by the engine. It sank out of sight in what was now deep water next to the track. One man who tried to swim to safety through the debris choked water was struck by a floating beam and disappeared. Fisherman Ellery Thompson had found his boat, the Eleanor. The next morning after the hurricane, no one could do anything that night. Everything was black. You just hold up wherever you could. So in the morning, I went out looking for my boat. So one of the Riley boys said, she's up on the tennis court. So we went up there, and uh, the pal, of course, is right, right alongside of her. And I was amazed, because all the planking 
they'd give away from the stem. That was a bare stem, and there wasn't one boat nail. There was one fastening. What had been keeping her afloat was just, I don't know, the pressure of water. And the ones that had fished her could have been lost on a plenty of times the year before. But I looked through the hell, I, went, I looked through the hell for her to see if I could find a lost bottle of whiskey because she was a notorious rum runner in the 1920s. <laughs> London and Stonington were choked with wreckage and littered with the remains of a large fishing fleet. But the worst destruction of all occurred on the southern beaches of Rhode Island. Napa Tree Point had been a delicate spit of land stretching westward from Watch Hill. There was literally nothing left of the dozens of solid homes. Many of these people were swept across the bay to safety, but just as many had drowned. Weekapog and Misquamacut before the storm. All that was left now were fragments of houses. Not even foundations remained. On these beaches alone, more than 100 people had perished. This was the week of Pog Inn from which Ella Ruick had been rescued, a gaping hole torn in its side. Charlestown, Galilee, Sand Hill Cove. The scene was surreal. Survivors and sightseers straggled over the piles of sand, and disconsolate homeowners sat in shock on what used to be their front steps. Sometimes only a pitiful sink or bureau marked the site of their houses. The arms of victims jutted from the wreckage. Many who drowned in the inland ponds had been wearing wading boots when they died. Their bodies were floating upright in the water and had to be spotted by airplane. The search for family and friends went on. That afternoon we started looking for my friend who lived across the road. He was four months younger than me. We couldn't find him anywhere, so they, there were firemen from Providence and uh, Peachdale, Wakefield. Everyone was looking for bodies. And the, the storekeeper down at Sand Hill Cove, he had lost his life, and they were looking for him. But we were looking for the boy that was my age primarily, and they suggested we go get his dog. So my brother went and got his dog, and we started out where the bird sanctuary is now. And uh, pretty soon the dog started digging. I was in the immediate area at the time. I was farther away looking in another area. And, the dog started digging, and the first thing he came to was the boy's hand. He was about six or eight inches under the sand, completely buried. And if it had been for the dog, I don't think we would have found him. Many teenagers saw death for the first time that week when they helped to dig bodies from the salt ponds and wrecked houses. Dogs who had been tied during the storm had drowned or gone mad trying to free themselves. The death count climbed. Three full days after the storm, between the morning and evening editions of the Providence Journal, 60 additional bodies were added to the count. By the end, nearly 700 victims were discovered throughout all of New England and New York, and over 300 of them were from Rhode Island. Narragansett Pier, a few miles north on the bay, only the landmark towers remained of what had been a formidable granite seawall and road. The waves had taken both apart and strewn huge chunks of rubble across the hotel lawns. Houses were ripped apart, smashed, gutted. Their contents spilled onto the road. Even though the National Guard had been mobilized in the morning, it had been a long, dark night for looters. What the waves had not carried away, these scavengers had. Further up the bay, tidy suburban communities, which used to enjoy a view of the water, now found their streets and yards filled with debris.
And in Providence, all the wreckage in the world seemed to have come to rest. Barges wallowed in the river. Tugboats had been lifted high onto pilings. And lumber yards had floated away and redistributed themselves over the docks. Cars had tumbled into the river and others were smashed and their occupants killed when walls collapsed on top of them. The roof of the train station had whistled away and come to rest here, a heap of twisted metal. Throughout the rest of the city, trees and cars and wires and houses lay in a tangle. Up the Blackstone River in Woonsocket, brick factories and stores had been bashed in, and this water tank showed how strong the wind had been. The smaller towns and villages in Massachusetts were wrecked, and one could follow the path of the storm northward by the trail of downed trees. The hurricane had roared through Vermont, weakening as it went, finally to blow itself out near Montreal. And in its wake in northern New England, thousands of acres of downed trees, hardwoods, softwoods, nearly 25% of the maple trees in New England down in windrows. It was estimated later that 40,000 deeds to woodland property would have to be resurveyed because their boundary trees were no longer standing. As often as these scenes of fallen trees are repeated, one has to remember that no one had ever seen anything like them anywhere before. The reason is simple. A major hurricane had never before struck an area with this kind of physical landscape. The picture postcard images of New England, quiet streets, stately old houses shaded by even older trees, all this was transformed overnight. The village greens, parks, and streets of the Northeast would not be the same again for generations. For some cities, the day after the storm, the trouble was only beginning. Swollen streams and rivers still ran at flood as their tributaries fed them. Rescue workers sculled through the flooded streets of Hartford like gondoliers as residents lounged and watched calmly from the tenements. There was nowhere to go. Barns had caved in from the wind, crushing poultry and herds of livestock. The rising water made castaways of those nimble enough to flee. Even as the water rose in the rivers, rebuilding and salvage had begun elsewhere. Boys and men picked gamely through the piles of debris looking for something salvageable. If the destruction was incalculable, so too was the fortitude one needed to face the job of clearing and hauling. It was a good time to own a roofing company or a scrapyard or a steam shovel. A radio, a birdcage, and a sewing machine. There was no logic to the objects one was left with by the storm, although just as often, there was the consolation of having saved something more sentimentally valuable. The region mobilized to help itself. Men long out of uniform took them up again as firemen, police, or rescue workers. In the fishing fleet, there was a remarkable new spirit of cooperation among the independent draggermen and longliners. I think one of the good things that came from the hurricane, it sort of upgraded the fleet. The next morning they were all on bottom, and naturally they had to be raised and taken to a shipyard. But uh, once they got into the shipyard, most of them fixed them up far better than they were before. And, 
their engines were in better shape. So I think it helped the fleet in that respect. Another thing I know it it proved that uh, a lot of fishermen, uh, well, one one bunch will work with another bunch, and uh, at this time, no matter who was your friend, who was your enemy, everybody was always helping somebody else. The, the whole the whole area would be uh, working on one man's boat, and then they'd shift over and work on another man's boat. And the Red Cross provided some of the funds to, for the materials to fix these boats, so they didn't have any insurance in those days. They didn't know what insurance was. They couldn't afford it. They did know. Yeah, before the hurricane, there's a lot of fish. There's much competition between the fishermen. I'd find a style of fish, and I'd put a just a short flag above the surface, something I could look see with my binoculars and no one else could see. And it was a lot of that, giving someone false tips. But that all ended with the hurricane. Everyone had banded together to recover, and from then on, you know. And then, of course, the government put uh, these uh, radio phones on our boat for defense purposes, you know what I mean, when the war came. So they'd call up the very wonderful cooperation, and they'd look out for one another. There was help from the outside as well. In three days, an army of 110,000 WPA workers had been shifted to emergency storm and flood duty. Every little man with a pick on this map represents 1,000 workers at the WPA. Manpower turning from regular public improvements and services into the breach in time of dire need. Where tracks remained to carry trains, thousands of these workers came by rail. Shock troops of disaster, someone has called them, because so many times in recent years they have provided the human sinews for great tasks of reconstruction. The telephone companies faced enormous difficulties. No hurricane had ever hit an area as populated as this, nor one so crowded with industry. And never before had the problem of restoring service been tied up, literally, with thousands of downed trees. To the linemen, the fallen elms were an additional nuisance, but their loss was to be one of the most enduring of the storm. Most scars on the land would heal in time. In the western part of Rhode Island, however, one industry would be completely transformed. During the 38 hurricane, we had millions of feet of it. And these tall trees actually blown over by the heavy wind, but we had about 10 inches of rain that uprooted all these, all these stumps and everything. They then blowed these trees down, crossed them up. And we had to go to work and salvage them all up. An area like this after the storm would be probably 15, 20 foot high. Everything would be crossed up in all kinds of directions, and you'd have to climb up way up on the treetop somewhere and look over top of it. You all messed up, crossed up all, all, always. So you'd have to start one end somewhere to, to get to it and be able, I mean, get the limbs off of it and pull it over and get down from the top. You start way up in the air, and sometimes you'd be up in the air 15 foot cutting logs up off the ground. Up, but them days all you had was crosscut saws and axes. There was no chainsaws. Four hundred million board feet of timber down in Rhode Island. One and a half billion board feet down in New Hampshire. After the storm, the government had moved in to salvage and buy virtually all the downed timber. And when piers and bulkheads and railroad ties and material for military bases were needed in 1941, the government had an enormous and fortuitous supply of lumber already stockpiled. For some people in the region, the memory of the 1938 storm has been eclipsed by another serious hurricane in 1954. But Ellery Thompson compares the two storms. No comparisons. I lived through the hurricane of Carroll of 1954, where the boats got away from the dock, and they had a job, and the big seas combing up the harbor and everything. But you could walk around. It wasn't blowing any heavy automobiles overboard. And that was, uh, that was a picnic day, according to 1938. 1938, down there on the, the stony waterfront, in the, in the Watchfield Beach, nothing could live. Cars. Heavy cars blown them right over like that until they went overboard. Houses carried right away. Oh, no. Nothing. I've seen a lot of gales in 40 years. Nothing compared with the 38. Don't let them tell you they can either. 
Nevertheless, two hurricanes within 20 years prompted the state to consider ways to prevent more damage. In the early 60s, the United States Army Corps of Engineers constructed a massive hurricane barrier just south of the city of Providence. Santo Amato, civil defense director for the state, is confident that the system of dikes, gates, and pumps will protect the city in another storm. The Corps of Engineers, uh, in their wisdom, have gone along the entire coast and tried to uh, develop this type of barrier uh, in the most potential areas that might be uh, vulnerable to these storms. And I think uh, they have done an exceptionally good job along this coast to prevent the, uh, a similar situation that happened in 38. The barrier has been tested uh, on a dry run type situation and also in a number of situations where uh, the water was anticipated to uh, cause a problem to the downtown area. And uh, it worked. It worked exceptionally well in all instances. It has had never been tested for the amount of water it's designed to remove or withhold. Uh, but uh, according to the engineers and uh, many, many other areas that have tested a similar type situation, it is and will work, we hope. The Corps of Engineers had planned additional barriers to protect other areas of the state, but it seems unlikely that they will ever be built. The engineers built two large-scale models of the bay at their testing facilities in Vicksburg, Mississippi. Wind, wave, and tide conditions were then created in scale to simulate the storm surge of the 1938 hurricane. This is what happened to the Oakland Beach section of Warwick. To hurricane-proof one of the major bays in the Northeast, it was an audacious idea, even by the standards of the Corps of Engineers. Besides the complicated barrier at Fox Point in Providence, the Corps wanted to build three huge rubble breakwaters across the West Passage, the East Passage, and blocking the mouth of the Sakonet River. First, they had to convince the Navy that the warships of the Atlantic Fleet based in Quonset and Newport could navigate through these breakwaters in high seas. The Corps had a more difficult time convincing residents of the area when public meetings were held. Not the least of the objections was the feeling many had that the Corps had underestimated the effect that its mammoth breakwaters might have on the complex natural systems of the bay, not to mention its natural beauty. Another hurricane would find the people living south of the Providence hurricane barrier just as exposed as they were in 1938 and 1954. Their safety would depend on how prepared they would be to leave their homes and possessions behind and evacuate while they still had the chance. Neil Frank, the director of the National Hurricane Center in Miami, must cope with a problem in pragmatic terms. Because we cannot forecast precisely where a hurricane is going to go, then we know that we must overwarn. We're going to tell you to take action more times than action is going to be required. Now, we estimate that every time we put a hurricane warning up, it's $25 million out-of-pocket cost to take the precautions. We do not put warnings up lightly. It's a very awesome decision to spend $25 million. So we're not going to warn you unless there is a threat. Now, under warning, the, the air in under warning is going to be measured in loss of life. We realize that over warning is going to cost you dollars but I'd lot rather be on the overwarning side than the under one. In New England, we haven't had a major storm there. Now since, oh, 1960, Hurricane Donna moved across the eastern part of Long Island in 1960 and then on into the south coast of New England. So you see, that's been nearly 20 years ago, and a lot of people are, that have moved to the coastline since that, since that storm, and new people coming to the coastline uh, have a tendency not to really believe that things can be as bad as they can be in the 1938 storm. So it's difficult for them, for us to get them to move sometimes and to take the precautions that are necessary in order to save their lives. Do we believe that
that a hurricane may strike again. If one can judge from how quickly people have resettled most of the areas destroyed by the 1938 storm, the answer must be probably not. This is Charlestown Beach before the 1938 storm. This is Charlestown Beach after the hurricane. And this is Charlestown Beach today. These homes cost about $60,000 on the average, but no protection is guaranteed, even from normal weather. A homeowner may return here in the summer to find that the winter seas have made some unplanned alterations to the size of his lot or the inclination of his house. For geologist John Fisher of the University of Rhode Island, the barrier beaches are a laboratory. Last year, he and his students discovered a remarkable relic of the hurricane's passing, a layer of coarse sand and large pebbles laid down on the beaches when the storm leveled them 40 years ago. That's one of the, that, that's the layer of the 38 hurricane in there. And this tight, flat, discoid waves came across the beach, so simply carried it over and deposited it on top of the dunes. And then this has built up since then. Right down there is this, where we found the pebbles is also the coarse sand layer. And that coarse sand here was deposited by the hurricane. For the Rhode Island coast and for the northeast, it gives us a measure of how much a dune will build up after an erosional phase, such as the hurricane. Because we can divide the 20 or so years between the 38 hurricane and the 54 hurricane, between the 54 hurricane and the height now at 78, and come out how many inches are built up each year naturally. Houses would not allow the dune grass to grow under the houses, and in many cases the houses are so close together that there's no room between the houses for dune grass to grow. And so when the uh, waves come in, uh, they simply attack the front of the cliff, cut back the scarp, and the houses fall in. Now in the case of a natural dune such as this, sure there's some undercutting, there's some slumping, but the sand essentially remains here, and then the sand also comes in from the beach where it's been carried out during the storm waves, the onshore winds such as we're having today, moves the sand on top of the dune. The dune grass is still there. It grows up through the dune and it rebuilds the dune. It might take two or three years to rebuild the dune, but nature will rebuild the dune. Nature isn't going to rebuild the house. The house is down and it's kindling. And that's the difference. When there were houses here before the hurricane of 38, not very many were built after the hurricane of 38. One thing that we can tell from a hurricane is those areas where houses should not be built. A hurricane teaches us where not to build. If this is so, it is a lesson which we may not yet believe. Certainly for many, the great hurricane of 1938 has become a distant memory, an event with mythical echoes of danger, of heroism, sacrifice, and common loss. But the wind and water which turned the familiar world upside down, these are impossible to forget. The passing of 40 years has not weakened the power of these images to remind us how fragile we were in the teeth of the storm and how durable afterwards. I couldn't sleep for a week. I uh, could see nothing but those huge waves every time I closed my eyes. I wouldn't worry at all. This house has been here through two of them. Two bad ones are still here. And if water come up high, I'd call up the step, one by one, up to the woman's apartment above me. Or stand on a table in the living room. Throughout New England, those who remember the hurricane are bound together by the shared experience. They were witnesses to something truly awesome. And together, they survived.